Okay, this is going to be extraordinarily informal. So, I hope that uh, if you have any questions while I'm talking, break in and, and ask them because uh, uh, you know, this is uh, going to be partially informal and uh, I'm going to end up talking about honey selection, back sweetening, acidity, uh, pre-boiling, nutrients, yeasts, and some other topics. Uh, but the first thing that I want to do is uh, talk about a new insight that I got just this last quarter. Uh, and I'd like to give you some information and then perhaps uh, get a little bit of discussion about it. And what started me thinking was I get a lot of throwaway magazines. One of them is uh, artisan spirits having to do with distilling. And there was an article in there that was talking about the cuts that you make in distillation. And uh, it was saying that, uh, uh, you know, really if you take just the center cuts, you get a lot of ethanol, but if you then put that ethanol, uh, you know, it's like Everclear almost, into a keg, uh, it's not going to develop very much good flavors over a period of time. That what you really need are some of the heads and some of the tails, and uh, if you drink it instantaneously, uh, you will find that it's not all that pleasant because it has all the heads and tails in it. But as you put it in the uh, keg and it matures, uh, that there are oxidation and reduction and uh, esterification and alcohols and aldehydes uh, that all convert into uh, other compounds that make your final uh, whiskey uh, substantially better than if you just use the center Everclear cuts. And that started me thinking. And I, I was thinking, okay, in, in terms of wine, you know, if you get a Merlot, uh, it's about as good as it's going to get when you get it. Uh, and it tastes pretty good. Uh, you get a young Cabernet Sauvignon and it's going to not taste all that good, but it's going to develop and be really good as it, it matures. And then I started thinking about uh, going from that to uh, mead, and I know that uh, Gelbert down in Valley City uh, makes a mead by ultra centrifuge or uh, ultra filtering the uh, uh, honey. And he takes out all the high molecular weight proteins and sugars then he ferments the uh, resulting stuff, it takes him about two weeks, uh, and then he uh, puts it through the ultra filtration again, takes out the yeast, and he bottles it and sells it like at two to three weeks uh, post-fermentation. Uh, if you taste it, it's really good. I mean, it, it, it doesn't have any off flavors, uh, except it's just a little bit on the thin side. Uh, it doesn't have very much complexity. Uh, again, it's nothing nothing horrible in it. It's a nice, easy drinking, simple sort of thing. And I've talked to some people and they said, yeah, and that's what it tastes like five or ten years from now too, that it never changes. That, uh, that okay, if you don't have some of that high molecular weight stuff in it to begin with, uh, you, know, you don't have the feedstock to convert to add extra complexity to it. Uh, you know, I, I've made uh, a lot of high-quality meads uh, uh, in the past. Uh, most of the time, when you taste mine at competitions, it's a uh, you know, minimum of a year, year and a half, two years, oftentimes three, four years. Uh, you know, it's just the way I do things. Uh, and uh, I, I oftentimes ferment mine certain leaves I, I, on top of the leaves. Uh, uh, you, you can't really do that with grape juice stuff uh, unless you... You, you need to rack off all of the trob and everything or else you, you get really ugly stuff. But it, if you're fermenting mead, uh, you know, the, a little bit of yeast down at the bottom or even a lot of yeast, uh, you know, sometimes I haven't even racked it at all and, and I've gone back two years later and, you know, it's, it's pretty darn good. Uh, but in, 19, in, in 2015, uh, when we were starting the meadery, uh, uh, my son Brian uh, set up a trial using uh, 22 different uh, yeasts, and we did it in 
uh, clover, we did it in buckwheat, we did it in orange blossom, and we did it in star thistles. So we had four different uh, honeys and uh, over 20 yeasts. We did them in uh, 22 ounce uh, uh, bombers with a balloon attached on top and a small hole. And then we uh, did a blind taste testing about uh, seven or eight months into it. And uh, it was interesting to me what one of the highlights was that uh, as we went through, uh, you could tell that most of the white wine yeast made pretty good uh, uh, mead, the, uh, uh, and the mead yeast made pretty decent mead. Uh, the red wine yeasts, uh, some of them did, and most of the beer yeasts were pretty ugly. Uh, and that told me that you really you shouldn't be making mead too often uh, with a beer yeast unless you really know what you're doing. Uh, but I, I add that caveat because at the, uh, uh, I was out at the, well, let, let me continue on with, the, with our yeast experiment because uh, when we did the blind taste testing, uh, I've used the White Lab 720 and reused it and reused it, uh, you know, like 15 years for this. And as we were doing the blind taste testing, we got to the, the beers that were really ugly, and by the time that we got to the third or fourth one, there were some of them that we didn't even, you know, we, got, we knew we were in the sequence, and we didn't want to put them in our mouth, they were so bad. And uh, one of them that was really bad, I said, oh, this is like the worst meat I've ever tasted. Uh, you know, I'm never, ever going to use this. And my son Brian says, uh, that's White Lab 720. <laughs> and I said, oh, shit. <laughs> Really? And it, it turns out that I think that uh, since I don't usually even taste my mead for the first year, uh, it must be pretty ugly to begin with. And it has all of these high molecular weight sorts of phenols and such that oxidize and esterify and uh, uh, turn out to be really, really pleasant in a well-aged mead that are just absolutely horrible uh, at the six and eight month time period. Now, uh, I, I, I say that about the beer yeast, but then I, in 2019, I was out at the uh, meat con in front of the Major Cup uh, judging, and they had somebody there that was trying to make mead in six weeks. And so they were evaluating, and they had samples from 15 different yeasts that they passed around to like 50 of us in the audience and the audience graded which ones of these were the best. And at the tail end, it was a beer yeast that uh, was best. Uh, but again, this is something that they're trying to make a, a bead that tastes good in six weeks. And my question from the floor is, what are these gonna taste like in two years? Because I don't care what they taste like in six weeks. You know, I don't, I don't uh, but if you're looking to make a mead in, in a short period of time for some, something, this says that if you select the right yeast and you go around it in the, in the right way, you have a chance of, of making a, a reasonable mead in uh, uh, six weeks. What was the six-week wonder? Uh, I, I, I looked back and I listened to the podcasts and I was trying to find out and I think that one of them was a California ale yeast and the other, uh, let's see. I, I have it in my notes here someplace, but uh, one of them was a California ale yeast, uh, and, and the other, it was another ale yeast. Uh, okay, so uh, then I come to my judging experience, and when you're judging meads, in, in my estimation, probably the most common feedback that you end up giving to uh, the mead makers is, Darn, this mead tastes like high fusel oils, servant, uh, solvents, turpentine, and rocket fuel. Uh, <laughs> perhaps you use too high of a fermentation temperature or a lack of nutrients, or you know, uh, but this will probably improve with age. Yeah. And now I'm thinking, you know, uh, that comment may tie back to the sort of the same sort of thing in the uh, the cuts of alcohol that you don't really want to be using Everclear to put in a keg to make good whiskey. That uh, 
Uh, you have to have uh, some things that, uh, at least to begin with, don't taste all that good. And a fair amount of the time in these competitions, you get a mead and it's just not ready yet. And that there are all these oxidation and reduction and esterification sorts of reactions that are likely going to uh, go make a better mead in the long run than, than if it had tasted good right then. So I, I, I'd like to hear, what, what do you think about that? Is that, uh, you know, all, you know, all of a sudden I'm thinking about, uh, uh, gee, what tastes good in a mead? Uh, it depends on when do you want to drink it. I mean, if you want to drink it in six weeks, uh, I can tell you, don't use White Lab 720. <laughs> <laughs> you might be better with the California ale. Uh, yeah. Um, I've had really good luck with uh, Scottish um, yeast, um, but usually I would try that with like a, um, a hydromel because it's not really going to do as well with the larger sure, you know, content must. Yeah. But, but one of the things that this tells me is that uh, uh, really, if people say, what is the best yeast for making mead, uh, there is no one good answer because uh, it really depends uh, how you're going to treat it, uh, what kind of nutrients you're going to use, uh, uh, how long before, you know, do you want it for competition two years from now, or do you have a wedding come up in, coming up in nine months? And uh, uh, that it might be a totally different type of, a, of uh, conditions that you use. Uh, and uh, the yeast that you use, depending on when you want it to taste good. My, my experience with oxidation and was, of meat was white wine. But it was white wine, it was a kind of yoga white wine. And it was at the vineyard with the winemaker. And he took the glass and said, Yeah, have you ever seen this drink? He puts his hand on it, he shakes it like crazy, and it ran out. It was yeah. a really different wine. And it was different in the well, oxidation is one of the things that I've uh, uh, looked into a lot over the years because uh, uh, unlike a lot of meadries, we ferment our uh, mead in uh, high-density polyethylene. And in a prior life, I was a scientist and I uh, was a world expert in uh, diffusion and permeability for a couple of things. And so I calculated, and we're getting about uh, uh, two liters of oxygen a year uh, that go into our mead uh, in our 500-gallon tanks. Now, uh, you know, for a white wine or a red wine, that would probably be uh, disastrous, and, and certainly for beer. Uh, you know, beer, oxygen, you know, once that you've done the primary uh, yeast sort of thing, uh, uh, you do absolutely everything that you can to keep oxygen away from it. Uh, in, in my case, you know, we do a lot of mead, and we open up bottles, and we let them sit around for two, three, four weeks, uh, uh, and it's still just about as good as what, what it started with. And so uh, I've looked into some of the oxidation, and I once tried to make uh, a true sample of what oxidized mead would taste like. So I had a mead and I, I took about a, a third of a gallon of it in a gallon jug and I uh, shook it up with pure oxygen ten different times to get you know, absolutely, totally uh, as oxygenated as you could. I put uh, aluminum foil over top of it and put it in the oven for four and a half hours and baked it. <laughs> and, I, well, I wanted to make something so I could say, okay, this is what oxidized mead tastes like that I should avoid. And it tastes pretty good. <laughs> now, a, a little bit later, uh, th this was about four years ago. Uh, th this is the last of the sample that I have of it. But this was extraordinarily highly oxidized. Uh, and you know, it's just been sitting on the shelf, a half-empty bottle, uh, for the last four years. <laughs> and and I'll, I'll, I'll have you come up and uh, take a, a little sip of it and see what you think of it. Because, yeah, I'd, I'd buy a bottle of it. <laughs> and this is truly hammered mead. I mean, you know, this is uh, you know, 
the other. I, I did absolutely everything I could think of. I, I went to beer camp uh, probably 15, 20 years ago, and and uh, where I first, you know, before I did all the beer judge certification program and everything, and, and my first uh, experience uh, down in Oldenburg, Kentucky at the beer camp was uh, uh, in the sensory panel thing. They had, uh, you know, okay, this is oxidized beer, and they said, oh, we just lifted took the top off, uh, shook it around a little bit, and put it in the oven, and, uh, and okay, now you can taste the cardboard of it. And uh, yeah, I mean, you know, so it doesn't take very much, and you can taste it in beer. Uh, I'll let you taste this and decide whether you'd buy a bottle of it, because this, this is a absolutely hammered uh, mead, uh, and, and it tastes darn good. Well, Carl, I think one of the things I learned when we first started competing against each other was I'd show up to a competition with a six-month-old me, and he'd show up with a six-year-old me. <laughs> age has a quality unto its own. You cannot fake it. You can make a really good me, and in six years, it's going to be a really, really, really good me. And like, there are no shortcuts to that level of success. So you're right. A six-week-old versus a six-month versus a six-year. There's not going to be a comparison. Yeah, I brought in a sample of a 19-year-old maid into one of the competitions, and yeah, it took a good, best show. So, so. Uh, Cheater. Huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the thing is, when he tried to age his maid, uh, I had a several-year head start on him, and so so he'd have a, a four-year-old maid, and I'd have a nine-year-old, and then and he'd have a six-year, and mine'd be 12. Yeah. So. Uh, so what, what do you, you just age them in the bottle? Or you yeah, just, uh, just in the carboy. You, you uh, sit there? Yeah, just, uh, okay. Uh, but by the way, uh, let, let me give you a little hint. Uh, if you're going to do long-term aging of uh, anything, uh, you need to worry about the, uh, the water and the uh, trap bubbling away or, or evaporating away. What you want to do is uh, go to the... Uh, uh, drugstore and get yourself a little bottle of glycerin and add just a little bit of glycerin uh, to the water and uh, glycerin doesn't evaporate uh, if it gets into the mead it'll just make it taste better it, it adds a little bit of a, a sweetness a little bit of a body to it uh, if, if you want to cheat and you have a, a mead that's a little bit thin uh, you, know, you can add just a little bit of uh, uh, glycerin to it and it'll uh, uh, add just a little bit of mouth viscosity to it <laughs> so, uh, again, just a little bit of that in the bubbling trap, and, and you never have to worry about it. Uh, but it's uh, not bottled yet, it's just in the, in, in the carboy. Yeah, it's just sitting in the carboy. Uh, right now, you know, I, I really need to get down in the basement uh, because uh, there's, you know, 50, I, there's 50 year old meat stuff there. You need to buy. I, I have, I, I went down and I looked to see what kind of a chore I had left. And, uh, you know, before I, I did the commercial, I, I ended up having 44 carboys of uh, uh, mead going before I went commercial. Uh, and I, I'm down now to 17, uh, and I, I think the oldest is 10, but probably the youngest is 7. And, and uh, so I, I really need to get down there and, and uh, uh, start bottling some of that just to you know, free up some carboys and uh, uh, get it into bottles. Okay. Uh, Honey. Honey is very important. <laughs> uh, first, for the, those of you that don't know, uh, when you go to the Medina Square and you get uh, uh, honey that's labeled wildflower, uh, what that means is wildflower is a generic uh, term for anything that we don't know what it is. So uh, if you're going to make, for example, a clover honey, and here in Ohio there's a fair amount of clover honey that's made. So what you do is you wait until the first clover blooms come out, and uh, as a beekeeper, you then go out and you remove about 80% of the honey. Uh, now, uh, over the next several months, uh, while the clover's in bloom, they'll keep going to the clover and clover until the clover bloom dies out, and then they move to buckwheat or whatever's next on their agenda. As soon as they switch that, what you go, and you can see what the newly deposited honey is, and you remove that, and that's clover honey. If you don't do that, and at the end of the year you just scrape it off, that's wildflower. It's often a different color, so you can see. Yeah, it, uh, 
Right, you, you can see the newly deposited, uh, uh, it'll, it'll be a different color from uh, the stuff that's uh, been there. Uh, in the springtime, it's usually a lighter color, just uh, uh, in the summer it gets a little bit darker, in the fall, uh, I, I think that's maybe a little bit of it's the aging of the uh, uh, honey in the cells, but more of it might be that, uh, uh, gee, there's more buckwheat out in the fall and that's uh, uh, darker, and, and so that uh, darkens the honey. So if, if you go to the Medina Town Square and get honey, uh, and you taste it, and you'll see almost everything there is a wildflower. Uh, and you find a wildflower that tastes good, buy as much of it as you want right then, because if you come back a month later uh, and get the same beekeeper and it's still labeled wildflower, it's likely to be totally different. So there's nothing ag against wild... Oh, by the way, if you're in California, about 60% of the wildflower honey is orange blossom. Uh, okay. <laughs> Here, a lot of it's clover, but I mean, so different areas of the country, wildflower depends on what the predominant flower is uh, uh, that they uh, uh, are consuming. So, okay, if you're going into a competition, uh, if you really want to make good mead, start with a good honey. I mean, you know, it's a, uh, well, what are some good honeys? Oh, sourwood, clover. Sourwood. Yeah. Well, cl clover, particularly if you're going to make a Mel Mel or, or a uh, Methaglin, because uh, clover doesn't have very much of a flavor of its own. Uh, Tupelo. 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 That, that's uh, uh, my second favorite in the world. Uh, uh, my, my favorite's Leatherwood from uh, Tasmania. But uh, 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 others that uh, are good. Uh, Meadow Foam. Uh, there have been a couple of people in our local competitions that have got their hold on, uh, on Meadow Foam. And, uh, right back there. Yeah, I was listening to a podcast where they were talking to some of the uh, you know, Vicky Rowe and, and their people, and they were asking what, what uh, you know, if you could get your hands on anything, what would it be? Metal foam. Uh, by the way, if you're doing metal foam, I might get some clover and uh, uh, ferment primarily clover, and when it's two thirds the way done, then put in the metal foam because uh, you know it's so expensive, so hard to get. Uh, you know, you you don't want it all to all the flavors and aromas to. Uh, go off during your fermentation. So if you have something really good, uh, you can use something like clover as a base and then add that later. Uh, by the way, uh, you know, I've made with uh, blackberry flour, cranberry flour, blueberry flour, uh, raspberry flour. Uh, all of those are, in spite of the fact that the fruits are totally different, the honeys are very, very similar because they all come from a white flower of the bush and it's before the fruit sets. So if you get a blackberry and a cranberry flower, there might be a little bit of difference between them, but there's not a great amount of difference in them. Uh, all of those are uh, sort of generic, uh, uh, you know, so yeah, they're, they're nice, but you can't really taste the raspberry and raspberry flower very much. Uh, orange blossom turns out to be really good. It a, has a nice flavor and uh, it's readily available because they, uh, you know that they, the beekeepers that pollinate the orange groves get about 75% of their uh, finances from the pollination fee and 25% from the uh, honey byproduct. So uh, there's a, anybody that's doing commercial pollination things, and they do a lot of that for the orange groves. Uh, that's why there's a lot of uh, uh, orange blossom honey. Uh, most of the, you know, I get mine mostly from uh, Dutch Gold. Uh, I found out recently that uh, 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 my, my son Brian was invited down, he was 1% that got invited down to Bentleyville, Arkansas to talk to Sam's Club and Walmart. And they were asking, uh, can you scale this up? And so he had found out before he went, he, he talked to Dutch Gold to find out, okay, how much honey do you sell? And uh, yeah, 90 million pounds a year. So, yeah, you can get it. Don't tell my wife. Uh, other honeys, uh, one that I've had in competition, I've never seen it, is the Hawaiian honey that they use uh, the, the flower uh, that they make the lays out of, uh, 
uh, Lihu, L-E-H-U-A. I had to look it up when I was judging it to find out uh, what the flavors were, but it's a very nice floral aroma and everything. So that one's nice. Uh, uh, coriander flower is uh, good. Uh, you know, buckwheat is, uh, uh, can be good. It can be, I mean, it's, it's like the strongest uh, uh, honey around. So uh, people generally like it, but there are some people that when they taste it the, are looking for something to wash their mouth out, and whether it's the honey or whether it's the mead. Uh, uh, but I, I've had uh, couples drive up from uh, Columbus just to get a case of uh, uh, our buckwheat honey, uh, our mead as well. So, uh, Okay, so any other questions on honeys? Uh, uh, I started out, by the way, uh, uh, my daughter was getting married, Scottish-themed wedding with bagpipes and kilts and pledging on the sword. And, and wanted mead uh, for the for the wedding, and uh, I went to Sam's Club and bought Sam's Club honey, uh, and uh, well, and it made really good mead. Uh, uh, the next time I, I knew a little bit more about what type of uh, honey to do, so I went to Sam's Club and I bought the Virginia clover honey. So, so at least it was a you know, a, a clover honey, uh, but still from Sam's Club. But you know, now I've got you know honeys from around the world and around the country and everything. I got a question for you. Yeah. You ever find that like any of the honeys that you get have like corn syrup in it or like? I I've like not had that problem myself, but I know that about ten years ago there was a gigantic scandal uh, that uh, it's rice syrup I think is uh, what was put in a lot of it. Uh, uh, the, there was uh, honey that was being shipped out of China uh, to Vietnam. Uh, they would uh, trans put it from there into a different barrel. Uh, and then ship it down to South America, transfer it again to a different barrel, uh, to, and uh, they would uh, filter all of the pollen out of it, so you couldn't tell what, uh, uh, you know, so all that was left was the uh, sugars, and so you can't tell the, you know, if there's pollen there, you can tell the country of origin. Once that they filter all of the pollen out of it, uh, and then, I mean, you know, there's pesticide issues and, uh, you know, adulteration, and you know, you added corn syrup and can rice syrup and stuff. Can looking at it or is it... I can't tell that much from, uh, you know, I mean, you know, I, I think even analytically you have a hard time. You, you know that uh, most honey is about 70% uh, glucose and fructose. And uh, uh, if you take uh, regular uh, sucrose from the table sugar and heat it up with a little bit of uh, cream of tartar uh, or lemon juice, uh, you get invert sugar, which uh, it breaks it down into glucose and fructose. So, uh, uh, again, I get most of my honey from uh, Dutch Gold. Dutch Gold is one of the ones that, I don't know whether they were stung in this or not, but they started a true source uh, program where they trace back all of their honey right to the hive, uh, at least theoretically. Now, I, I did go in once. I, I got a what was supposed to be a certified organic honey primarily from Brazil and I asked for more documentation to put it through the FDA. Turns out I, you know, I, I shouldn't have bothered because uh, you, you, have to go, you have to have your whole place certified organic before you can uh, label your meat as uh, uh, organic. But uh, uh, they ended up uh, giving me pretty detailed certification that went back to Brazil. Uh, so uh, so I, I've been happy with them. Uh, uh, I, I can tell you that uh, both sourwood honey and tupelo honey, if you look at the production figures and the sales figures, they sell about two or three times more than they harvest. So, <laughs> so I, I'm not sure how that works out, but uh, uh, other than buyer beware, uh, you know, make sure you're getting it from a, a reputable uh, place. What, when, when I get my Tupelo, most of the time it's either from uh, uh, Florida or Georgia, right from the ones there, or, or I get some of mine. Uh, turns out that a fair amount of Tupelo, along with uh, Star Thistle, is sold by the Sleeping Bear Dunes uh, uh, up in uh, Michigan. So and is, so, there, is there like a, a, a percentage that you need to have called a Tupelo honey? Like what percentage of that honey needs to be fairly confident? My guess yeah. is that uh, by regulation it should be at least 51%. Yeah. <laughs> but but I, I would hope that it's more than that. I mean, I, I think most of it that I've got, I mean, I've, I've got it from 
uh, two or three different places down in uh, Florida, and it has a really good flavor. Uh, one of the things you can tell, perhaps, is uh, Tupelo honey is one of the few honeys that doesn't crystallize very well. And so if you have a, around a, a jar of Tupelo honey, it's been sitting there for a couple of years, uh, and, and it's not crystallized, that's more likely uh, Tupelo. Than, if you ever see crystals start to form in your, in your Tupelo honey, uh, think about where you bought it from and, and uh, don't buy it from there again, because uh, Tupelo is one of the ones that really doesn't crystallize. Now, now the crystallization doesn't really hurt the honey, uh, uh, other than I, I can tell you when you're trying to scrape it out with an ice cream scoop. Uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, uh, and from a commercial standpoint, uh, uh, you know, give, give me a 3,000 pound uh, uh, lump of it. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I had that problem. I, I, you know, we, we buy, instead of five gallon pails, most of our honey comes in 3,000 pound uh, uh, bag in a box on a skid. And uh, uh, all the time that I get it from Dutch Gold, it always comes with a uh, look like an electric blanket heater in the bottom of it and a cord that comes out. You just plug it into the wall two or three days before you're going to pump it and it uh, warms it up so it's uh, more like body temperature instead of uh, uh, you know ambient temperature. And all the crystals are gone. Oh, well, there, there's no crystal. I mean, you know, I, we don't keep it in the uh, that volume, you probably wouldn't need to worry about crystallization for the first year or two. Uh, so, I mean, you know, some of them would might crystallize a little bit sooner. Yeah, but, but again, uh, when, when I'm doing it, I, you know, it's a lot easier to pump uh, when it's uh, uh, you know, up around body temperature rather than uh, uh, a molasses uh, consistency. So, uh, and then I bought a... Uh, uh, a cube of it from uh, of buckwheat from Iowa, from a different supplier, and it came in and it was sitting there a month or so, and I got around uh, ready to uh, uh, heat it up and, and pump it, and I'm looking around and I can't find the cord, and so I call the company and say, uh, uh, "Where's the cord? You know, I, I can't find where the cord comes out." They said, "Oh, um, we didn't put one in. That would be another penny a pound uh, for the, uh, you know, it would have cost like thirty dollars to have." Uh, <laughs> On this eight thousand, nine thousand dollar, you know, it would have been another thirty dollars if we had put a heater in the bottom. Uh, the worst. What? Yeah. So I, I went home and uh, swiped the uh, electric blanket from uh, our home bed and, and three or four or five heating pads and. Uh, about every two days, I could go in and uh, uh, pump another inch off the top of it. You know, I, I couldn't heat it from the bottom, but I could put the uh, electric blanket on the top and, and stick in some uh, uh, heating pads, and every couple of days, I could get another inch or two of it. And, uh, eventually, I got it out. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I, I make sure now that any time I'm talking, we get these 3,000-pound things. Uh, yes, it does indeed have the uh, heater in the bottom. Uh, okay. Oh, English ale yeast. Uh, I, I, it was the California ale yeast and the English ale yeast were the two that uh, made reasonably good uh, mead in six weeks. Ah, uh, boiling. If you read Ken Schramm's book and a lot of the other historical books, uh, and a lot of commercial meteries from around the world, the technical papers, uh, they boil the mead uh, to start out with, and that gets rid of, I mean, it's, it's for contamination issues and also makes it so you have less haze in the mead at the t because it gets some of the protein, uh, makes a foam, goes up to the top, you skim it off, and so you don't have as much protein in it. And so you, you don't get the protein haze that sometimes you do uh, in a mead. So uh, I always thought, you know, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because uh, if you're doing any kind of boiling, you're going to lose all kinds of uh, aromatic uh, uh, aroma. And so I, I, I tried it back around oh, 2012 or something. I, I did a side-by-side -side comparison, uh, uh, boiled and not boiled. And it amazed me that the, uh, uh, the boil really did not lose aroma. In fact, it might have been just a little bit more aromatic. And I'm looking up in the literature. And uh, in 2015, 
literature, there was a trial, and they compared no boiling to a short boil to a vigorous boil, and, and the vigorous boil, you know, it's kind of caramelized, and no, that wasn't all that good, but the short, the short boil, uh, you know, just heat it up and, and cool it back down, uh, was actually judged to be superior to the uh, one that with no boil. So just like a five minute boil or something? Yeah, they, they took it up to 215, and uh, uh, just for a couple of minutes, and then uh, uh, you know, lowered it back down. Uh, actually, they did it really quick. They put it through a heat exchanger. Uh, to, so after they had it at a high enough temperature, uh, I think they were doing it primarily for uh, you know, potential con contamination that I've never, I don't think that's much of a problem yeah, anyway. Color, like green, huh? temperature yeah. like that? Yeah, you, yeah it, 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 just a little bit browner maybe. Yeah. So you get a little bit of color. But what I'm saying is, gee, if you want to do a trial sometime, uh, uh, boiling is not as bad as what I thought it might have been a long time ago. Uh, you know, it's a, uh, you know, so maybe the historians uh, had some things right when they, when they were talking about uh, boiling it. Uh, I mean, everything was unsanitary back there. I mean, the water that they're using was not the chlorinated stuff that we get. Uh, so I mean, they probably had to boil it anyway, just to, uh, you know, because of the gross conditions around at the time. But it's a possibility. Uh, back sweetening. Uh, at our meadery, we try to, we try really hard, never have to do it. Uh, and let, let me tell you why. Uh, when you start out, you have both the, the possibility of contaminating bacteria and yeast, and you throw in the yeast. Uh, yeast have developed over years uh, a defense mechanism about bacteria. Bacteria primarily like the glucose. And so the yeast will go for all the simple sugars first. And then after they get the glucose and, and then the fructose, then they'll start on uh, the higher sugars. Uh, and then, you know, at the tail end, uh, you know, so if you take it clear of the way to dryness, not only have you got rid of the glucose and fructose, but now you've got rid of all of these residual high molecular weight things that really add a lot of flavor uh, to your meat. And now what do you do? You take it and you dump back in the glucose and fructose in honey. And uh, uh, I don't know how many mead judges there are here, but uh, uh, yeah, some of us can tell <laughs> that uh, uh, if you've back sweetened it uh, uh, with honey, uh, it kind of almost sets my teeth on edge sometimes. It, it, uh, the, the glucose adds a uh, kind of a sharp, sweet flavor that uh, uh, so you're a lot better never to get rid of all those high molecular weight sugars that you've got. Make sure that, uh, uh, and then if you do have to back sweeten it, uh, I've done a whole lot of trials uh, from like the one batch out of uh, you know, 50 that we've had to do a little bit of back sweetening to. And I can tell you that about a third honey and two thirds sucrose uh, is a lot better than any of the rest of them. That uh, the, the honey, will add a little bit of brightness and uh, a little bit of flavor and aroma to it. And uh, then you add the sucrose so that you're not adding all the rest of the uh, glucose and fructose of the honey. And, and so you can use a, a blend uh, if you really have to. But uh, uh, what we try to do is, uh, uh, well, you'll get to try one. Uh, we, we try to uh, make one that's uh, uh, extra sweet, and then we'll use that to blend if we need to. So. Uh, if, if something's too dry, we'll blend something a little bit sweeter with it. And I did the same thing at home. I mean, you know, if, you, if you have uh, 45 different carboys, you can, you can do that. So, to loop it back around to what you were talking about at the very beginning with your yeast, like, is the level of dryness that you're aiming for in the yeast that you're using, is obviously going to contribute to the level of dryness that it eventually gets to. So, is that a consideration other than the flavor that it is? but also the level of dryness that you're Well, the, the type of yeast will, uh, if you let it go to dryness, but there, uh, you, you can sort of slow it and stop it, and I've learned a couple of tricks uh, that I wish I knew earlier. Uh, but are they, your yeast fermenting the meat out completely, or are they petering out before they're done? Well, you'd like to have it peter out before it's done, but uh, if, if it looks like it's going to go Oh, by, by the way, if you want a Christmas gift or a birthday gift, uh, 
you, you can ask uh, them to get you a tilt hydrometer. It's a, about $135 on uh, Amazon. And you can throw it in a carboy and uh, it changes its uh, uh, level of tilt depending on the uh, uh, residual sugar. And so you don't need to be opening it up and taking samples all the time. You, you can watch and you can see, you know, it doesn't even matter whether it's giving you a true reading or not because you can watch and see uh, when it stops going and you'll know, you know, yeah, if it keeps going down pretty steep, then he needs to do something to stop it. Uh, my trade secret is that uh, uh, I found that if I can stun the yeast, oh, by the way, uh, if it's actively fermenting, never ever dump in uh, potassium sorbate. A potassium sorbate you put in to keep anything from re-fermenting. If you put it in an actively fermenting jar, uh, the yeast will consume it. And although I've never uh, tasted it, uh, uh, it says it tastes like rotten germaniums, and, and it's very specific, and, and, and it's impossible to get rid of. So, uh, if it's actively fermenting, you can't add the sorbate in that you use to keep things from re-fermenting. So, what I do is I add uh, a fair amount of, uh, you know, I add like twice the amount that I normally would of potassium metabisulfite, uh, Camden uh, tablets. And that will sort of stun the yeast. And uh, then I'll add in uh, uh, sparkloid, or you, you can either use sparkloid or bentonite. Uh, bentonite and sparkloid are two clarifying agents that work sort of the same, but on opposite ends of the spectrum. One of them attaches to the positive things of all the particles and pulls it together. And the other acts on the negative particles and pulls it all together. Uh, so either one works. Uh, you never want to add both together because uh, they'll just claw them together and drop out because, uh, uh, you know, one positive. Now, you can do it sequentially. If you do sparkloid and then it's still uh, not clear, you can add bentonite or something after it's all clarified. But anyway, in terms of mine, uh, after I stun it, I add something to get most of the yeast to drop down to the bottom, and then I rack off the top of the yeast, add a little bit more potassium uh, metabisulfite to it, and then uh, I'll, I'll wait a day and then I'll add the potassium sorbate to it and, th and that'll keep it from re-fermenting. Or you can put it outside in the cold. <laughs> <laughs> that works. That doesn't work. Well, you could not, not this year. What <laughs> day? <laughs> Just a couple of more minor things. Uh, one is nutrients. Uh, uh, I, I can, let, let me tell you that Moonlight Meadery, uh, uh, Fair, uh, Fair Brother from uh, Moonlight Meadery said that uh, uh, they went from just adding nutrients at the beginning to doing a staggered nutrient addition and they changed their selling from a year to six months after doing it. So if you can keep the yeast happy with a staggered nutrient addition, uh, it tends to mature it a little bit better and you get better tasting mead earlier at least, according to him. So, uh, but the, almost everybody now uses a staggered nutrient addition, particularly at the home level, uh, because it's easy to do at the home level. All you do is you decide how much nutrients you're going to add and uh, you divide it up uh, into a quarter, a quarter, a quarter, a quarter. And you throw a quarter in at the same time that you're pitching, a quarter at 24 hours, a, a quarter uh, at like two days, and a, a quarter about uh, you know, three or four or five days after that. And that, uh, uh, the added nutrients slowly will make the yeast a little bit happier and give you a better fermentation. Is it important to get fermentation going quick? Or like, I mean like beer, you know, like you want to get it going. Slow and steady. When I was using White Lab 720, reusing it, uh, you know, I just had yeast setting down at the bottom underneath uh, some mead, and I'd stir it up, throw a little bit of sugar or honey in it, and uh, pitch, and I, I would get really antsy if it didn't start fermenting by two to three weeks because I was afraid of the other stuff that might be uh, happening. So, uh, at a commercial level, certainly you don't want to risk that, and so you, you're adding the yeast, and hopefully it'll go. But whether it whether it goes and goes rapidly and 
and you're all finished and you know if you're going to age it for six months anyway uh whether it takes uh uh you know That's right yeah I just weird not seeing the big housing on the top now, now i i did a side by side with and without nutrients and with and without oxygen uh to see what would happen and I can tell you that at the tail end, that that I had more nutrients and more oxygen fermented down to about a percent lower uh, residual sugar than the other. So, I mean, you know, and that's after two or three or four years, uh, you know, that it, it just uh, because of the, the way that it was fermenting, it fermented more uh, before it uh, uh, kicked out. And that's just with a side-by-side. Which one tasted better? Huh? I couldn't tell much of the difference other than, uh, I mean, it's really tough to compare different meats that have different levels of residual sugar because you're tasting the sugar almost more than anything else in terms of uh, uh, the, the flavor profile. And so, I, I, you know, it was a buckwheat that's pretty strongly like, flavored anyway, so, uh, you know, I, I couldn't tell much of the difference. So. Uh, and, uh, oh. What nutrients to use? Uh, when you're doing the staggered nutrient addition, uh, if you read the, a lot of the literature, you'll find that uh, DAP is uh, very nice, particularly in the beginning of the fermentation. But as the uh, yeast get further and further in the fer fermentation, diammonium phosphate isn't as wet, readily uh, consumed by the yeast. So when I start out, I use mostly DAP because it's cheap. Uh, and then I switch over, you know, and, I, and I have a blend, and I keep going uh, less and less of the DAP, more of uh, uh, Fermit K, and then Fermit K is not so good, at, and then Fermit O. But Fermit O is a lot more expensive, too, and, and it's fluffier, so it takes more. And, and uh, uh, So anyway, when I do my staggered nutrient addition, uh, I'll start out mostly with DAP, and, and then transition to more and more of the Fermit K and finally the Fermit O on the tail end. At the homebrew level, Fermit O is fairly cheap. Right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know. I mean, some people just use that all the way through, yeah. but I, I think the DAP is uh, probably as good as anything. Uh, DAP is what we usually buy as yeast nutrients. Right. Yeah. right. Yes. But when you buy yeast, uh, L.D. Carlson yeast nutrient is uh, DAP. Yeah. <laughs> So it's Fermate K. Fermate K has a high percentage of DAP yeah. versus Fermate O. For, and DAP is like cotton candy to yeast. Like it'll it'll eat yeah, that up you, first, and so it's like, wow, it gets really excited. Right. And then you want to slow it down with the, as Carl said, you blend in the Fermate O. I use all Fermate O because I'm only making 10 gallons at a time. He's making 3,000 pounds at a time. Right. <laughs> a little different. The economies right. are a little different. Yeah. Cheer. Uh, final comments on uh, acid addition. Uh, if you read uh, uh, Ken Schwab's book, uh, he tells you uh, approximately how much acids to add, and he has you dump them all in at the beginning. And uh, uh, I went from doing that to, uh, uh, and if you ask, ask Ken now about his book, there's a lot of stuff in there that he would not agree with now, but uh, you know, uh, that, that he, when he wrote it 30 years ago, you know, he didn't know as much as he does now, but uh, uh, the, the thing about adding all the ads at the, at the beginning is not a good idea. But you might, you know, it might improve the pH a little bit to have a little bit of it in there. Uh, but I rarely put in acids until I'm totally finished and I'm uh, just about ready to bottle. And then I do the taste test to see, you know, oftentimes I'll start out with an acid blend or something. And, and so... Uh, you know, I'll see, is it better with a little bit of acidity to balance or not? And if it is, then I'll say, okay, which acid is better for this particular one? And so I, I might try malic and citric and tartaric and, and, uh, uh, and then the uh, dark horse is ascorbic acid. And it, it turns out that uh, vitamin C, uh, in about half the times when I'm adding acids, uh, uh, ascorbic acid, vitamin C, is the best flavor, uh, which kind of surprised me. But, uh, uh, but, and it adds the added benefit of it's an antioxidant. And uh, uh, so, you know, since I keep all of mine for a long period of time, uh, a little bit of uh, antioxidant, it's always a good thing anyway. 
Okay, so any other questions? Uh, uh, yeah. What if, it, what if your mean is too acidic? Huh? What if your mean is too acidic? Uh, what do you add to that? If it's too acidic, uh, try, try this 14 year old orange blossom that I bought. I, because I, I think that is just a little bit unbalanced now. I, I, I haven't opened up a bottle in several years. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm tasting and saying, ah, you know, if I was, you know, if it is too acidic, uh, a little bit of potassium bicarbonate. Uh, 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 you know, uh, you can get it by a pound for a pittance, and and you know, just a, a touch of it will. You know, I, I've had some truly disgusting uh, wines and meads that uh, are just, I mean, you know, they're acid bombs. And uh, uh, boy, I, I had one of them. I, I was thinking after I adjusted it, I I wish I'd kept some of the original to bring it into the meeting and say. Isn't this absolutely horrible? Okay, now look and see what you can do with it because a little bit of potassium bicarbonate to it, and uh, damn, it, it, it just, yeah, it was drinkable again. I use KOH potassium hydroxide. But, okay. Same concept, just one at a base. But most of the time, what you're doing is you're adding uh, a little bit more acidity. Uh, you know, it's uh, not too often, uh, at least with the young ones, it's not too often that you. That you have it uh, uh, too acidic. Usually, it's a little bit flabby and uh, you know, lacks character, and so just a, a touch of acidity brings out the flavors, makes it uh, uh, sparkle, dance on your tongue a little bit more. All, all these technical terms. <laughs> okay, what I have up here, by the way, uh, I, I have a 14-year-old uh, uh, orange blossom from my basement that, uh, as I say, I opened up and it's not quite as uh, uh, outstanding as I thought it might be. I, I have uh, a bottle of our standard uh, uh, just sweet mead, it's uh, Orange Blossom. And uh, then I have uh, uh, the one that is not out in commercial distribution, uh, but this is, uh, you know, you can buy it at our meadery. Uh, this is our extra sweet. This is the one that I had around for blending, but I tasted it and I said, damn, you know, this stuff is pretty good. Uh, all bottles, several cases, and, and yeah, almost everybody uh, that uh, tries it uh, uh, ends up buying some of it. Uh, I can't taste the honey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you'll, you'll be able to taste the honey on this. But what I, what I want you to do when you taste this extra sweet is think of an ice wine. Because with an ice wine, uh, it smells sweet. When it hits your tongue, it's sweet. The first part of your taste is sweet. The center is sweet. The finish is sweet. And then the long aftertaste is dry. And you'll see that with this, that it'll be sweet, 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 sweet. And then you put down the glass and say, hmm, yeah, that's nice. Uh, because it's, it's sort of a dry, long after finish. And, and this we sell for $20 a bottle versus uh, you know, like $45 for a split of the ice wine. So, so we, we also have an extra sweet in uh, the mesquite uh, at the Meadery. Uh, so come up and try. Oh, I, I brought also uh, one that's not available in the stores yet. Uh, when I made wine for my daughter, uh, it was just a plain uh, mead. And uh, when my son, about five years later, said he was getting married, and what he wanted was a blackberry mead. And I said, oh, yeah, all I've made is traditional. Now I have to learn how to make a, uh, uh, you know, a Mel Mel. So uh, uh, he gave me almost two years, and uh, 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 we made an extraordinary blackberry mead for the wedding. Uh, you know, when I make it for the wedding, I usually make about 15 gallons. Uh, we have enough uh, for a small 187 milliliter bottle for each of the guests with nice customized labels on it. We have it on the table. And then the uh, wedding couple get uh, like 25 bottles of it, one a year for their anniversary. Oh. And I'll tell you, after about 10 years, uh, when the anniversary comes around, the whole highlight of the anniversary is, oh, we get to open up uh, that, <laughs> uh, yeah, and try another year older mead. So, so anyway, as soon as I started making mead for the meadery, uh, 
you know, I, I got encouraged to make uh, blackberry mead, and both he and his wife said, by the way, when you make the blackberry mead, just remember that we are the official tasters of the blackberry mead. We, we have to approve it. And so I, I had tried making it over three or four years, and I just couldn't find the right blackberry that tasted good, had the right aroma, had the right flavor. I finally found the right one. And uh, so I made this up, and I finally I took it to him, and I said, okay, here's my formulation. I have uh, like 55 gallons of this made up, uh, but I can adjust it. Uh, here's some of the base mead, and here's uh, some of the uh, uh, blackberry juice uh, concentrate. Uh, so you can try it uh, either a little bit more or a little bit less. of uh, uh, And so my son, who turns out also to be, uh, this is Keith, so he's the one that's uh, also a mead judge. Uh, you know, he tasted it and said, oh, you know, this is really, really good. It might be better with just a little bit more of the base mead to bring out the uh, uh, orange blossom. Uh, and his wife tasted it and said, you know, this is really, really good if it had just a little bit more of the blackberry. Uh, <laughs> and I said, I got it. <laughs> nailed it. There it is. <laughs> I nailed it. So, so you, you can try it and uh, tell me what you think. But uh, this, So this is the result of... Uh, uh, you know, long uh, search for the right things to make it so it tastes really good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.